CNA marks its 25th anniversary this month and, of course, we're celebrating, but we're also taking the opportunity to look ahead to the next 25 years here in Asia. I'm Arnold Gay and thanks very much for joining us on this Asia First TV and radio special on the future of Asia. And I'm Andrea Heng. Welcome to the final installment of this very special series. So yesterday, we took a look at the region's healthcare challenges and the solutions for them. But today, we want to turn our focus to another urgent subject, sustainability and the climate. And it's urgent because Asia emits about half of the world's total greenhouse gas emissions. And that share expected to increase if the right policies are not put in place. So what will it take for the region to lead the charge against climate change and secure its future? Well, Chan Yuim joins us to tell us more. Hi, Yuim. Hello, good morning, Arnold. Good morning, Andrea. Asia is, yes, very crucial in the battle against climate change. By some estimates, temperatures are rising two times faster here than the global average, meaning we're going to see more frequent and severe weather-related natural disasters. Uh, Malaysia knows this all too well. Parts of the country are especially vulnerable to weather extremes. So we'll look at the human cost of climate change and its policies on mitigation and resilience. And then we go to Vietnam, which remains one of the world's largest coal power producers, but it is trying to overcome obstacles and tap its vast potential for renewable energy. But we'll start in Singapore and explore how its green energy ambitions will transform its transport sectors in the coming decades. Singapore's ambition to power the nation with clean energy is taking off. A year and a half since operating its first flights with blended sustainable aviation fuel, national carrier Singapore Airlines now plans to replace 5% of its total fuel needs with the cleaner alternative by the end of the decade. SIA's Chief Sustainability Officer Lee Wen Fern says the fuel is promising, but more is needed to support its use. Sustainable aviation fuel has the potential to reduce greenhouse gas emission over its life cycle by as much as 80% compared to conventional jet fuel. But sustainable aviation fuel has its challenges. Today, the production of sustainable aviation fuel is low, only at 0.2% of global aviation fuel requirements, and it is expensive at three to five times that of conventional jet fuel. It's a long runway, but not the company's only carbon-cutting move. SIA is also keeping its fleet young and modern with newer fuel-efficient planes and greening its engineering and ground operations. But getting to net zero emissions by 2050 also means charting a greener course at sea. The shipping sector is testing biofuels, methanol, ammonia and hydrogen as future bunkering fuels. This can help global shipping meet green targets set by the International Maritime Organization. New Ace Young is director of the Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore. So as a top bunkering port, uh, so Singapore offers a platform for the global shipping community uh, to come together to work with us to, to help set standards for the new fuels, to pilot and trial the use of these fuels, and so that um, we can um, bring this to the, the IMO. By the end of the decade, new harbour craft plying these waters will also have to be compatible with pure biodiesel or net zero fuels like hydrogen, or go fully electric. That's already happening on the roads, where the country is phasing out petrol cars in place of electric vehicles by 2040. There are subsidies and a ramp up in EV charging points island wide. Dr. David Brodstock leads energy transition research at the National University of Singapore. Simplifying the domestic power supply chain by removing diesel and gas petrol and replacing them with electric at the point of use for the regular consumers and users is going to be a very important way to tighten the control that we have over just cleaning the power supply itself. Cleaning that power supply means greening the energy mix, 
in a country where nearly 95 percent of electricity comes from imported natural gas. It's harnessing the power of the sun, flirting with the possibility of nuclear energy and exploring the potential of geothermal heat. Alessandro Romagnoli at the Energy Research Institute is hopeful. Singapore has one of the highest geothermal heat gradient uh, globally in similar um, geological settings. So that even encourages even more to keep exploring on, uh, on, on geothermal. In the nearer term, the country is looking to import 4 gigawatts of low-carbon electricity by 2035. The Energy Market Authority has granted conditional approvals to projects in Indonesia, Cambodia and Vietnam. This comes on top of smaller-scale imports already coming in from Laos through Thailand and Malaysia. There is hope all this will form part of a future ASEAN power grid that integrates the national power systems of the bloc's 10 member nations. Dr. Mirza Huda leads research in energy and climate at the IC's Yusuf Ishak Institute. So what the ASEAN power grid does is that it facilitates the greater uptake of renewable energy. Uh, it helps transfer electricity uh, produced in uh, a region far away from the demand center and uh, this essentially helps to generate energy and meet demand without compromising the environment. The ASEAN grid will play a major part in getting the region to net zero by 2050, but it will need significant infrastructure investment and a meeting of minds to integrate processes and operations. Challenges to occupy the region for the next 25 years and beyond. Vietnam remains one of the world's largest coal power generators. The hydrocarbon makes up around half of the nation's energy mix. Here's Denzel Eads, Vice Chairman of the British Chamber of Commerce in Vietnam. Coal, which has been a key part of um, Vietnam's power mix today, has been integral to um, ensuring that there's been sufficient power supply in Vietnam and it's supported Vietnam's economic growth. The funding sources which have previously been relied on for coal are no longer there. Um, financial institutions, global financial institutions have decided they don't want to, to finance new coal projects. So the reality of the global situation um, uh, comes home to, to, to Vietnam. The solution may lie in the country's vast potential for renewable energy. Vietnam already has the region's largest wind and solar energy capacity, more than double what other ASEAN countries have combined. Denzel Eats explains the two key drivers behind Vietnam's wind potential. Vietnam has an incredibly long coastline, so by virtue of that, there are a significant number of areas as to where offshore wind can be developed. Combined with the fact that wind speeds in Vietnam are some of the highest um, in, in Southeast Asia indeed. Its land size and location in the sunny tropics also position it well for solar power. The country hopes to leverage this to help reach its target of net zero emissions by 2050. Prime Minister Phạm Minh Chính is clear about what's at stake. We aim to have a green economy. We have to achieve green manufacturing. We have to export green products. And we have to ensure green energy for foreign investors in order to achieve sustainable growth in Vietnam. There's more on the line than foreign investment. Vietnam is on the front line of climate change with increasing risk of extreme weather, rising sea levels, storms and typhoons. An estimated 70% of the population live in coastal or low-lying areas and are exposed to these threats. The reliance on coal is a double-edged sword for communities faced with the risk of climate change tomorrow and the cost of living today. Hanoi resident Nguyen Thị Thơm says it's getting harder to cope. The rising electricity price is hitting my family's pocket really hard, hurting our ability to spend. Higher electricity prices will also increase the prices of other items such as food. So the impact is big. I am very worried. The need to ramp up power sources is clear, but renewable energy projects have been beset with problems. 
Research company Global Energy Monitor cites a lack of clear policies and incentives, insufficient grid capacities, and uncertainty over pricing. Government regulations are a key missing piece, and Vietnam's anti-corruption campaign has also held back new projects, says John Rockhold, head of Power and Energy Working Group at the Vietnam Business Forum. A lot of people, I say, are, are, are more nervous about moving forward and making a mistake, then, then it's better just maybe I sit back and wait and, <laughs> and let, let, let things work out. But the energy needs uh, now are becoming uh, much more, uh, as you saw a few, a few months ago, you know, where we did run out of uh, electricity. Northern Vietnam saw rolling blackouts and power cuts in May and June as it struggled to meet soaring electricity demand in an especially hot and dry summer. The outages hit hard at civilians and global companies operating in the country. Vietnam's Prime Minister last year approved an ambitious plan to boost wind and solar power while reducing reliance on coal. The aim is to ensure energy security as the country transitions to carbon neutrality. The estimated price tag nearly 135 billion US dollars in funding for new power plants and grids. John Rockhold says this is something the government doesn't have, so more cooperation is needed with the private sector. However, in the renewable energy sector, you'll see the private sector saying, well, they're taking a lot, a, a lot of the risk. And this is something that the private sector can't do on their own. We're going to have to bring in the state bank. We're going to have to bring in the Ministry of Finance and come to an agreement where, where these problems are. The Just Energy Transition Partnership, co-led by the EU and the UK, has also pledged 15.5 billion US dollars as a start to help wean the nation off its coal dependence in a way that leaves no one behind. But the question is how far this can really go to get Vietnam on track to net zero. Tung Ngo, CNA, Hanoi. December 18th, 2021. The northeastern monsoon season collides with a low pressure weather system. It brings unprecedented rainfall to Malaysia, triggering widespread flooding and landslides. The disaster claimed 54 lives, displaced more than 70,000 people, and cost the country an estimated one and a half billion US dollars. Sungai Perda in Pahang state was one of the worst hit areas. Village chief Chu Yilan explains. The whole village was turned upside down, covered in logs, branches and debris, like a mountain. The villagers, we were all shell-shocked. All of our houses were demolished. When are we going to get back our homes? Ms. Tu tells me that many villagers remain haunted by memories of what she calls the timber tsunami even as they continue to pick up the pieces. This village, with some 60 households, were almost wiped out by mud floods. Now, this whole areas were covered in debris and logs when I was here. Now, more than two years on, restoration is still ongoing and houses are still being rebuilt. State authorities have been helping to restore villages, but not quickly enough for some residents, such as Po Son. I really hope that the government can speed things up a little. We have been waiting for over two years to move into our new home. To reduce flood damage, homes here are no longer made of wood, but built from bricks and mortar. They are suspended on stilts two and a half meters above ground. The houses are at least 40 meters away from the river. But not far enough, says Dr. Nuru Ashikin Mabawi, a lecturer at the School of Housing, Building and Planning at the University of Science, Malaysia. Ideally, I would say that is to vacate the land, to, uh, up to 300 to 500 meters. It should be a river reserve. It's not just 40 meters, it should be more than that. That's where we can you know, prepare ourselves for climate change or whenever the rainfall exceeds the reasonable forecast. That forecast for the coming years is grim. Projections from the World Bank's climate risk profile for Malaysia show the frequency and extremity of flood events will keep increasing with continued global warming. 
The country's environment minister, Nick Nazmi Nick Ahmad, is developing a national climate change act. He says the law would ensure greater coordination between the state and federal levels on climate change policies, especially when it comes to protecting forest land. There's a long, long challenge that the federal government has. You know, um, land, forest, these are the few powers that the state has um, absolute, you know, almost absolute control in that sense. And, and obviously they guard it very, uh, you know, jealously. He says Malaysia is committed to a 50% forest cover. And that means a current freeze on issuing new licenses for timber plantations and more boots on the ground to curb illegal logging. Here's Environment Minister Nick Nazmi Nick Ahmad again. We need to always be on the watch uh, to ensure that uh, we can, uh, hopefully one day, we can make deforestation zero in the country. The most crucial part of it is that there has to be strong um, regulatory and certification elements. Curbing deforestation could, in the decades ahead, mean the difference between livelihood and devastation, even life and death for the people of Kampong Sungai Berda, Pahang, but also countless other villages across Malaysia on the front lines of climate change. Melissa Go, CNA, Pahang. <laughs> And as we see there, Malaysia bearing the brunt of climate-related disasters. And even as we speak, Malaysia is undergoing a heat wave. Now, we are obviously still also feeling these changes here in Singapore. So, Uim, mm. what are the mitigation plans for the long term? Oh, Andrea, in Singapore, the threat of rising sea levels is real and critical. About 30% of Singapore's land is less than five metres above the mean sea level. For example, it's especially bad in the East Coast area, where floods can occur when high tides meet heavy rain. And the impact of this could be severe because the area has critical infrastructure such as Changi Airport. And so to try to mitigate sea level rise, there is a plan to reclaim land and build a long island off the east coast away from the existing shoreline. And the idea is this will offer solutions such as coastal protection, flood resilience and water resilience. Of course, Singapore's plans over the next few years and decades include its 2030 Green Plan and also its 2050 Net Zero Emissions Target. Uh, all of this forward planning is needed because Singapore's third national climate change study projects higher temperatures, rising sea levels and more wet and dry extremes by the end of this century. UM, there's clean energy and there's dirty energy, namely fossil fuels, which is the leading cause of climate change. Can you help us get a sense of the scale of greenhouse gas emissions here in this part of the world, Asia? Sure, Arnold. But first, I think we need to establish that the world is not on track in wanting to prevent this so-called climate catastrophe. Global emissions last year hit a record high of 37.4 billion tonnes, and coal emissions contributed about 65% of this CO2 uptick. That was made worse by shortfalls in hydroelectric power because there were persistent droughts worldwide last year. If you remember, 2023 was the hottest ever recorded in the history book. And looking at the biggest CO2 emitters around the world, China, the US, India and the European Union together, about 83% of emissions. And in Asia, we are home to five of the 10 largest emitters, China, India, Indonesia, Japan, South Korea, about 45% of global emissions altogether. So essentially, Arnold, uh, three main things to consider as to why Asia's future will be heavily shaped by climate change. First, APAC nations experience more natural disasters than any other region. This region is also a key source of the greenhouse gas problem because more countries here are developing quickly. These industries need power, but then shaking off that coal addiction is not easy. And also, remember that there's an ongoing global energy crisis we have to bear in mind. So moving away from coal to renewables is not as easy as it sounds. So, Yuim, as we bring this series to a close, what message do you want the audience to leave with uh, after watching these stories? 
Uh, Andrea, CNA marks its 25-year milestone, so we wanted to offer some perspectives as to what the next two or three decades might, might look like. So if the past few years are anything to go by, it's not possible to predict the future, but we're hoping that these stories will resonate some way with the audience. Perhaps topics such as the digital disruption might hit home because jobs are at stake for some people, or others might be thinking about whether we're ready to face another health or climate crisis. And we started with defence on Monday because having that stability as a foundation is important for nations here and the region. We sometimes feel quite far removed from what's happening elsewhere, but the threat of war is a real and present danger in places like Ukraine and the Middle East. And it's a timely reminder that the peace and security that we enjoy here is hard work. And so the point of this Future of Asia series is to get the audience thinking about the stories we tell, create some curiosity about what's happening in different parts of this dynamic and diverse region. And um, as always, to help them to understand Asia a bit better, Andrea. Oh, you in? That's very well put. Thank you so much. That wraps up our week-long Asia First TV and radio special on the future of Asia. SCNA marks its 25th anniversary this month. We thank you so much for watching.